Okay, I'm going to start. I'm going to open because I know Ms. Uh, Art has to, to go shortly and we definitely want to get started. So i um, going to open up and then we're already recording just so everybody is aware. Okay. So um, I wanted to just thank everybody for attending uh, today. Um, this is part two of our Uptown Candidates Forum on Quality of Life Issues. This is a, a unique opportunity for our Uptown community to uh, engage with people running for political office uh, on something that's very important on quality of life issues. Um, as we know, it's been consuming a lot of us all over the city uh, for a while now, actually. Uh, my name is Tanya Bonner. I'm the chair of the Wahi Inwood Task Force on Noise. We have been working very hard with other with our task force members uh, to uh, engage with city agencies and elected officials to address these quality of life issues that have been uh, challenging our community uh, for quite a while now. Um, and joining us today, uh, just so you know who you're engaging with in terms of our team, we have uh, David Tom, who will be uh, working with you in the chat. Um, and then we have uh, Liz Ritter, who will be uh, uh, helping everyone, admitting people and, and, and answering some of your questions. If you have questions related to this event or have any other needs or, you know, to address any concerns, uh, she will be here with us. Um, we also uh, have L'Oreal Crowder, who will be our timekeeper uh, today. And uh, we uh, have Cheryl Miller, who was also kind of helping us out today. Um, and uh, a little bit about the Wahi Task Force on Noise. We are as I said, a community-based uh, task force. Uh, some of you have probably read about us. Uh, we have thankfully have gotten a lot of mentions from elected officials who have implored uh, <laughs> uh, the mayor and others to, to deal with these issues. We have, as a community, uh, basically organized uh, to, to uh, address these concerns. I have another role, but I'm not functioning that role today or throughout as, as chair of this task force. I am also the second vice chair of community board 12 in Manhattan, but I am not doing this task force in that role. It's, it's separate. Um, and, but I do live in the community. I've been here for 16 years and I have definitely seen some challenges and in increasing uh, uh, quality of life challenges in this community community that I'm very concerned about. And uh, so we have been, we met for the first time our task force in November of last year. And we have engaged with pretty much every single city agency uh, that is, that touches any of these issues. Uh, and we have also met with all of our elected officials on this issue as well. Uh, I wanna thank those who joined us for part one where we had our city council candidates as well as all of our candidates for Manhattan Borough President and the Manhattan District Attorney. Uh, that was a very informative uh, forum. And tonight we welcome some of our candidates for mayor. Um, we do appreciate the people who have joined us. And I say we are in the midst of voting season. We are right here in the middle. So see, see who's joined us, see who showed up for you. Uh, Art Chang and Aaron, is it Foldenauer? Let me make sure I pronounce it correctly. You got it perfectly, Tanya. Yes, so Aaron, there you go. yes, they are two of our candidates for mayor. They have joined us tonight. Everyone was invited, um, including the people that the media has labeled as the, the top contenders. <laughs> and I say that the media. Um, but they were all invited. Um, we did move this event twice in order to accommodate all, everyone, knowing that there were no events tonight that were scheduled. Um, and so these, so we want to thank the people that did show for our community. And as you go into the voting booth, keep those things in mind. Uh, we want to start by opening up for the candidates to begin to give their opening statements. Um, I do want to tell everybody that it, it, well, before, while we're to, listening to the candidates, you could start putting questions that you may have for the candidates in the chat. Uh, Dave will be working with you on that. Um, and he, you will see him giving you messages and he will, you know, choose some folks to, to state their question live. Uh, but that will, you know, we will also be 
pulling questions just to ask from the chat as well. And we have some of our own questions. Um, and so we ask everyone to please keep their cameras off so we can focus only on the candidates tonight. Um, and, uh, it, and that's it. So we will open with uh, Art Chain to give your statement. We will start in alphabetical order and we'll reverse it each time so it's fair. Uh, please give your opening statement. Tell us whatever you like the uptown voters here in Washington Heights and Inwood to know about you, your candidacy, and your anything you'd like to say on quality, quality life, issues. life issues. Thank you. How much time do we have? You have two minutes. Have two minutes. <laughs> okay, you can see terrific. the clock. We have our timekeeper time here. Okay. Oh, great. Well, that's very helpful. All right. Well, thank you all so much for having me here. Uh, my name is Art Chang. I am a candidate for mayor. Um, now, you know, to Tanya's point, and just thank you for recognizing that the so-called leaders are not, not necessarily the leaders. Um, I am someone who has not taken, I don't have a PAC. I've not, I don't have no billionaire support. Um, I have no um, real estate money backing me. And um, I, start, I decided to enter the race in November and I announced in December. So it's been a very short period of time. But let me talk about myself because I think um, the lack of name recognition is actually quite a contrast to my actual life experience. Um, I'm a progressive, I'm a tech entrepreneur and I've been a reform activist. Um, I have very big ideas based on equity and restorative justice because New York City has to work for everyone and has to be a city where everyone belongs. I have very specific ideas to jumpstart this vision. And some of those do include the quality of life issues around noise. Um, if I firmly believe from my own experience that efficiency will lead to progressive outcomes, that we can may have a government, government that is more responsive and more efficient and we can do this. And I'm the person to get it done as mayor because I've spent the past 30 years as a leader and innovator delivering solutions to some of the toughest problems for the public good and in business. I co-created NYC Votes. I put, helped put Queens West on the, on the East River waterfront in Long Island City in the ground. I was on the board of the Brooklyn Public Library, re-envisioning it as the on-ramp for digital literacy. Um, I co-created Casebook, which is the only web-based government social services platform. It's a system of record in the state of Indiana, totally transformed their child welfare business. And I created a tech on-ramp from CUNY into the tech industry. So I'm Mark Chang and I wanna make New York City a place that works for everyone. I have to apologize that I have to leave at seven, but I'm also gonna just say right here that I have Zoom open office hours that you can book right on my website. If anybody wants to come and ask me a question, we also accept all direct messages on all of our socials. And please put all of that information where they can log into your website on in the chat if you could. Great, I will do that. Thank you. And Aaron, now you're up. Uh, your opening statement. Thank you, Tanya. My name's Aaron Foldenauer, candidate for mayor of New York City. So in this Democratic primary, I am the first, the top candidate listed on your ballot. And it's an honor to be here today. My first apartment ever in New York City was in Morningside Heights on 119th in Amsterdam. So towards your direction. And I visit Inwood not infrequently and Washington Heights. So it's great to talk with you today about quality of life issues and other issues. And I do wish some of the other so-called leading contenders were here today. But many of you are asking, do I have a chance to win? Now, as it turns out, I ran for New York City Council just four years ago here in Lower Manhattan, did quite well. And I'm actually holding my own in the polls for mayor. You have a bunch of other mayoral candidates now under one scandal or another. Uh, one of the recent polls I was, I was polling ahead of both Ray McGuire and Sean Donovan, each of whom have millions of dollars to their name. So I think particularly with ranked choice voting, people are gonna be surprised about what my campaign can pull off. And one of my key issues is talking about reopening and revitalize our city. And I've been saying for months that we have to encourage residents to move back to stay here in New York City. And if we don't address the quality of life concerns, the noise, the drag racing, 
the flagrant traffic violations, then people will leave and we'll lose our tax base. There's a lot of things that we need to pay for here in the city. We need to keep our residents here. And I'm glad I'm here to talk about this. Again, my name's Aaron Foldenauer. I'm in the race for mayor. Um, and I look forward to speaking with you and hearing from you tonight. Thank you so much, both of you. As we said, those who are just joining us, who have been here, uh, that we um, are grateful to have these uh, candidates with us today. Uh, as we said, we invited all candidates. We moved the event twice to make sure that everyone had an opportunity to come. And uh, these they showed for us today and some of our top contenders in the, according to the media did not. Um, but we do welcome the people who are here today and we want you to get to hear them and hear about their platform. And we are grateful to have this opportunity to be with them today. Um, I'm gonna open just with a question um, that we have about something that everybody is really annoyed with right now, which is fireworks. Um, I'm sure that you know, some of you have also experienced, you know, I don't know where you live in the city, but um, some of you may have experienced some of these issues. Um, but we want to know what is your your plan uh, to uh, uh, stopping uh, these illegal fireworks, not only the distribution of the fireworks and the supply of the fireworks into community, but also the people who are igniting, who are engaging in the behavior in the city. So what is your, what, 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 if you were elected mayor, what would you do to address this firework issue? And we can start uh, with uh, Mr. Chang. I live in Brooklyn in Prospect Heights. Um, it is about, um, you know, I live two blocks from where the West Indian Day Parade or Jump Up as some call it, um, starts and ends. And um, so I'm very familiar with the fireworks issue. Um, it is not just around July 4th or Labor Day. Um, it happens sporadically kind of around the year and especially when the weather starts getting warm. Um, fireworks are really a problem because it's, they're hazard. They're not just a nuisance in terms of the noise, but they're also a hazard for the people who are igniting the fireworks as well as for people who are nearby. Uh, we have had fireworks in our neighborhood um, set fires um, uh, in, uh, in front yards, um, in the street. Um, it is very, very dangerous for pedestrians, especially small children and the elderly and the disabled. Um, and so it's really something which has gotten out of control. So as with all things related to this, you know, I am a, a huge proponent of working with the community first and then working backwards from that. So um, I believe that we need to have unarmed violence interrupters and uh, social workers and others who are trained in dealing with people directly. And then if necessary, we'll bring in the police to deal with it. But it is something where we have to talk to people first and try to convince them to do the right thing for the good of their neighbors and for the entire community. Now, there may be times and like, like around the West Indian Day Parade, immediately, immediately afterwards, around July 4th, where we might have to let some, some steam off by allowing some, a safe area for fireworks. But that has to be done in partnership with the government. It has to be done in partnership with the community policing, with the police officers, and with the, with the, with the buy-in of the neighbors. So I'm a huge proponent of actually having government touch people directly where they are. And I think we're gonna be able to get to a much better place if we have that kind of collaboration. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Foldenauer. Fireworks. Thank you, Tanya. The bottom line is fireworks are dangerous and they can't be allowed in a place like New York City where we all live in so close of a proximity to each other. I'm here in the financial district even though I lived uptown before, as I told you. Luckily, we haven't had too much of a fireworks problem here, but they're proliferating across the city. And not only do fireworks present a hazard in, in and of themselves, but also they lead to other disputes in, a, in, in our neighborhoods. In Brooklyn, a citizen last year went out and went outside to kindly ask someone to stop shooting off fireworks, and that citizen was murdered. So the bottom line is we have to get the police involved to visit these 
places where fireworks are being ignited and citations and or arrests have to be issued. Same pr please, pretty please to some of these people shooting off fireworks may work, but oftentimes it won't work. So sadly, in this day and age, we have to get our police involved. We also need to cut off the fireworks supply at the source and do what we can to prevent them from coming into the city. I would also use the shot spotter devices that we have across the city today to detect illegal fireworks and then have rapid response teams in place across the city when it's likely that these fireworks are gonna be ignited. And then those teams can immediately respond and find the people involved. And they're, we're going to have to take their names and issue citations and take the appropriate action. Because again, warnings, unfortunately, are not gonna be the answer to this problem. Thank you so much for that answer. Uh, Dave, I understand we have a couple of people who would like to ask questions live. The floor is yours. Yes, I'm gonna call on Deborah Barrett and see if I can get her to unmute. Yes. Deborah, I'm... you can see the prompt. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Yes, uh, thank you. I just like to ask both of the candidates this evening, as I said in my, uh, as I said in the chat, you know, it's really hard to actually speak to you now because outside there are car, there's car racing and there are boom boxes. So it's really hard for me to concentrate, but I'm gonna do my best. I've lived in this neighborhood. I live on the corner of 189th and Amsterdam Avenue. So I'm on the east side of Washington Heights. This issue is all over Washington Heights and it's spreading around the city. What I have discovered in terms of the issues for drug dealing, open drug dealings, almost always associated on corners where a bodega is located. Uh, drag racing, just uh, flagrant, uh, how do you say, uh, uh, abuse, not abuse, but ignoring the traffic lights so that cars, motorbikes, motorcycles go through a red light. Uh, and all of those associations, the the uh, rather all of those issues are the NYPD, at least in 34th precinct, responds as such, quote, we cannot do anything. The mayor has tied our hand, number one. Number two, uh, they said, well, you know, politics are involved. When I asked what kind of politics, they said, well, people want to defund the police. I said, well, I don't, I don't know that anyone in our precinct or in our neighborhood are pushing to defund the police. Well, they are. They are. We can't do anything about it. They have said that they cannot issue tickets to those playing boom boxes well above the decibel levels because they don't know to whom the boom boxes belong and they could issue a wrong ticket or an inappropriate ticket. So what's your question? So the question is, what do you, you know, here we are suffering. What are you guys going to do? Okay, so we'll start with Mr. Bolenauer. Since you went last last time, we'll start with you. Thank you very much. It's I don't blame the individual officers for not enforcing these laws. The unfortunate thing is that we've tied our police officers' hands. Either the mayor or someone very high up in the police department has said, do not enforce these laws, these noise laws, these traffic laws that are on the books. So what I will do when I, Aaron Foldenauer, become the next mayor of New York City is that I will create, for example, a noise-specific police task force. And it will be just like speeding, where we will, I will have officers positioned in key locations across the city with decibel meters. And if a vehicle goes by, a loud motorcycle goes by, that violates the noise ordinances, the noise laws that we have in New York City, the police will then pursue that vehicle and issue a ticket. The only thing, warnings only get so far this day and age. If all our officers did was issue warnings for speeding, then guess what? Everyone would speed because everyone would know that they would only get a warning. So what I will do is actually enforce the, the, our noise ordinances with specific a specific patrol actually issuing tickets, and it could even be automated, just like we have red light cameras today. 
You could create an automated system where a vehicle violates the noise limit in an egregious way, a picture is then taken, a recording is made, and then a ticket is sent in the mail. So these are problems that we can't, um, can't avoid not solving. I'm sorry, there was too many double negatives in there. These are problems that we must solve because as I said, we need to keep our tax base here. We need people to stay in New York City, to visit New York City and spend money here and earn their incomes here. Because if people like all of you get fed up and leave, then the city is gonna face a downward, downward spiral. And that's what I will prevent as the next mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chang. Could not agree with Aaron Moore. Disagree, could not disagree with Aaron Moore. Um, there are two points. Number one is um, I would I would ask that you if you if the police ever tell you that they are not allowed to enforce the law, ask them to show you the order. It is we have more police in the city per capita than all but four other cities. The police are on an informal slowdown where they are not enforcing on the books laws, not at the directive of the mayor but at some directive, and I don't wanna point fingers, but this is happening across the city. The, the police officers, the police department is not subject to, has zero accountability to the mayor because the police commissioner holds 100% of the disciplinary power for the police officers. So if the police officers disobey, the mayor has no power to fire them or discipline them or give them any kind of, of, um, of uh, things on their, on, their, on their records. So um, these are, um, this, it's a major problem. And so I've proposed that we take away from the commissioner the sole disciplinary power over the NYPD, that we create a truly independent civilian complaint review board and adjudicatory body to be able to, to provide proper discipline to the police officers. The second thing is that this, this technology will not work. As a technologist um, who, is, who knows about both audio and vi video, that audio is imp almost nearly impossible to track to a particular point um, based upon the sound trajectory. And so, you know, this idea that we can automate the ticketing for noise violations just it is just infeasible um, from a technical perspective. So we have to have people do this. We have to have people who are out there enforcing the rules that we already have. And this is not, you know, this is not something which you can blame on the mayor. I hate to be in a position, by the way, of, 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 uh, of defending our current mayor for anything, but there you go, you've heard it from me. Uh, Tanya, one note on my end, if, as we hear from other questioners, I'd like to hear more about when this started happening, these problems, yeah. because maybe we can help address the, the, the root cause. Yeah, we will definitely, we can go into that. Uh, so we want to get the next live question, Dave. So we'll get, probably be able to get one more question in for Mr. Chang before he has to leave. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, please just ask your question, get directly to your question if you ask it, just for in the sake of time. Hi, my name is Donna Filippone. Um, I'd like to know what in your background, career, or otherwise qualifies you to run a city with 7 million unruly, very disparate uh, needs, expectations, and hopes um, so that we can all live a civilized life. Mr. Chang. I mean, so I'll tell you, I grew up in, um, I was born in Jim Crow, Atlanta. I grew up in an all white school district in Akron, Ohio. Um, I experienced racism on the street. My first kindergarten teacher summoned the principal who had said, said in front of me, I'm not gonna teach this boy because my brother is fighting people who look like him in Vietnam. The anti-Asian hate that you see on the street today is what I grew up with almost on a daily basis. I grew up in a domestic violence household where I often didn't know if my mother was gonna be alive. And where when you called the police, they generally did nothing. And, um, you know, I subsequently, education for me was a light at the end of the tunnel. I tell you, if I had a gun in my house, I would not be sitting here right now. 
because I was a very angry young man. So I empathize a lot with the anger that communities are feeling when they're not given that treated equitably and they're facing housing and food instability. Um, the other thing um, I'd like to say about that is that um, I ended up you know, trying to figure out how we get, get, but get around this and how we do better. Um, I became this, I went to Yale University. I was very lucky. I became the second man to graduate with a women's studies degree. I moved to New York with $400 in my pocket. I really struggled. Um, I did well, but my first company went bankrupt. And I lost everything again. I started all over again. I know what it's like not to pay the rent and not to be able to put food on the table. I came to New York in 1985, and you all remember what that was like. I moved to Fort Greene, lived in Clinton Hill, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, but since 1990, I have worked in the city's corporation council's office, um, helping transform their technology practices. I worked in the, um, it helped create, uh, put Queens West in the ground, the first project in the country to have a universal broadband. Um, I was on nine years on the campaign finance board, and I've had, I've worked two jobs almost my entire life. I started off teaching music. Um, I worked in um, uh, design and architecture. Um, I worked in investment banking and, um, and uh, started 12 companies here. Um, I know what it's like to be, to experience toughness on the street and the, and the toughness in, in government and in business. So I am so sorry, I have to go. I'm so honored that you had me here. Thank you so much for making this space for me. Um, and anybody is welcome to directly message me via my campaign email or via my website at chang.nyc. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, again, we appreciate the time we had with you. Um, and like I said, you put it in, your, in the chat where they can reach you. So uh, if they have any further questions and we will continue our one-on-one -on -one discussion uh, with uh, Aaron Foldenauer. Thank You're you in so good much, hands. Mr. Chang. Thank See you. See you soon, Art. Thank you. See you. See you, Aaron. Thank you. Okay, so um, uh, you and me, Aaron, we're going to have an intimate conversation. You're going to get hit with all the questions. <laughs> I'm ready. And, and, ready? To, and to the question that came before, I appreciate it because we need to get someone in office as the next mayor who's actually qualified to take the bull by the horns and get things done. I'm a lawyer. I know how to find the, the levers of power and pull them so that we can get things done. One of my areas of, pr of practice is election law. So in the course of working with a number of political candidates, I can tell you that 99% of them mean well. However, the majority of them actually do not actually know how to get things done once they're in office or they are bought and sold by special interests like the real estate industry or otherwise. And that's why I'm running on as a non-establishment candidate at, on a real change platform to become the next mayor. And people are gonna su be surprised when they see how well we do, particularly since I have the top ballot position and particularly with the vicissitudes of ranked choice voting. I've been a coalition builder for a number of years, the Gotham Gazette called me the environmental advocate in, in politics. I ran for city council here in lower Manhattan. And for years here, I fought to save the Elizabeth Street Garden, which is a local community garden in Little Italy. And it's an area where there aren't any other parks around. So I fought for green spaces. I've been working on environmental issues for some time. And I know this is being recorded, but I'd love to have a more intimate one-on-one -on -one back and forth conversation with many of you here to hear more and learn more from you about what you're experiencing there in, uh, in Inwood and in Washington Heights now. Uh, when I lived in Morningside Heights some years ago uh, in a low rise building, I did not face the noise and fireworks issues that you're experiencing now. So I do want to use this as an opportunity, not only to tell you about my message, but also to hear from you. And then of course, hopefully earn your support. Yeah, we could definitely think, we could definitely arrange to have you have a uh, Facebook live with us, uh, with our group. Uh, that definitely. would be great. Yeah, we could definitely do that. I mean, you and I can talk after this 
to arrange that. Okay. And what, and Sounds good. Well, definitely before election day, we got to do it before election day. Okay. So um, Dave, uh, do you have any more live questions or do we want to ask one of our own? Uh, yes. Carlos or Anna's up. Okay, great. Uh, Hi, Carlos. How are you? Um, so my name is Carlos Duran. I am the I am the program director, uh, sailing program director at a nonprofit in the South Bronx. I live in 207th Street. I don't want to take too long with the question, but there is some background that I want to say. Um, when I was 17 years old, I was walking down 207th Street and in the middle of the night, and I was stopped by cops pointing their guns at me. And eventually, I found myself. Uh, facing five to 15 years in prison for something that I didn't do. And I had to spend five years of my life. And mind you, this was when I was 17 years old. I'm 31 now. now. Um, I had to spend five years of my life to trying to fight this case so that I don't have a criminal record so that I can find a job today. Now, too often uh, do I see uh, these uh, uh, candidates who uh, don't really see this side of uh, our community and our, my community, you know, I just happen to fit the description and my, our community is mostly Hispanic who also fit the description. And too often uh, these things that happen in our community, the solution is call the police, call the police, they'll do something. And when they don't do it, do enough, they, they push them and push them and push them until they do things like what they did to me. Um, and so my question for, I wish the other candidate was here, Mr. Chang. But my question is, uh, uh, I would like to know how you are going to bring together the full spectrum of the ethnic population of our community, which is mostly Hispanic, uh, to not allow the historically racist New York City Police Department to exacerbate the disparities in arrest, harassment, and convictions that too often are for petty crime, petty and vic victimless crimes. Uh, thank, and thank you very much, Carlos. And I do very much em empathize. I am a defense attorney. And the fact of the matter is, is that in our society, an innocent person is locked up every day. Now, who's talking about that issue? Very few people are actually talking about that issue. And it's a serious one. So uh, I'm sorry to hear about your experience and the system needs to improve itself. I've known people personally who are 100% innocent and they get caught up in the system, they get arrested wrongfully, and then it lands on the DA's desk and the DA doesn't know what to do and just says, okay, I'm gonna prosecute and let the jury decide. And then the judge hears the case and is like, well, I don't know if this person's innocent, so I'm gonna send it to the jury and then the jury hears the case and the jury is like, well, I don't know that, the, but the person certainly looks guilty. And then you get caught in the system and you can't find your way out of it. And thus, that's why I'm focused on criminal justice reform. Part of bail reform has been a good idea, sort of to give people a chance to defend themselves so that they aren't in prison. So we have to, we have to recalibrate the system. We have to recalibrate bail reform and we need to recalibrate the system. That's what I'm focused on. I also have put forth a comprehensive police reform platform. A couple of things I'll just say about the police without going over my time. One, we have military style ranks in our police. We have captains, we have lieutenants, sergeants, so on and so forth. That creates a military style mentality. I would get rid of that because that affects their mindset. Also uniforms, most people don't know that Rudy Giuliani redesigned the police uniforms in the 90s to make them look more intimidating. But remember, that affects the mindset of the officer as well. And if you look at an officer walking down the street today, they have so many weapons and things uh, on, on their waistband, and it gives them the sense of this militaristic power. So that we need to change. So there are a lot of things we need to do on police reform. Carlos, I appreciate the question because there's a lot we need to do and that I'm gonna do as the next mayor. Thank you so much. Um, I have a, a kind of a related question uh, with to that. Um, when we talk about, and someone mentioned it, and I have to say, I'm gonna say the name uh, Robin Fleming mentioned this, as this is related to the next question I'm gonna ask you. 
that she said that unfortunately this is this is important it's not on top of we're talking about the people who are breaking the laws not innocent people so in keeping with this comment from robin and thank you for that i wanted to ask how do you plan to balance the management of quality of life crimes like noise garbage traffic graffiti fireworks dirt bikes by law enforcement with the legitimate concerns regarding over policing in communities of color. So how, where do you see this balance? How, how, how do you plan to, to reconcile people who are blatantly breaking the law or, and going against the rules and regulations that in laws we have on the books and rules and regulations we have versus this concern in, in, in communities of color about over policing? I appreciate that, Tanya, appreciate the question. It's an important issue. You have to find the right balance. And I think we found that balance to give the current administration some credit with respect to some of the COVID regulations. So for example, uh, masks on the subway. I don't think any tickets were ever issued by police officers um, to require people to issue masks, although technically it is a violation if you don't issue a mask and you can be fined. I don't think any tickets have been issued. If so, it's been very few. But yet, if you go on the subway today, 95%, maybe even 99% of people are wearing masks on the subway system. So kind of announcing the rule and then polite reminders. I've had instances where officers have been handing out masks at the subway turnstiles. Uh, the carrots worked more so than the stick. So with respect to quality of life concerns, let's talk about uh, let's talk about noise, say uh, noise levels when it comes to souped up vehicles or loud motorcycles. You can pull people over, show, tell them this is a serious thing, give them a written warning and one your first strike is no fine. But if you get pulled over a second time, then maybe there's a fine involved in that case. So we can go, we can use carrots, we can use sticks. Um, you can set up checkpoints. There's different ways to do it. We can be creative about how we do enforcement. I saw a good comment in the chat and I'd love to hear more live questions by the way. So if you have a question and haven't signed up to ask it live, please send Tanya or our host a message. Tell them you wanna ask a live question. But someone mentioned earlier, what about parks? People staying in parks after hours. You don't have to issue a ticket at 11.01 p.m. if the closing hours are 11, but you can have officers around and say, please start making your way out. And you can have a police presence and kind of go from there. So we need strength in numbers. I think we can be gentle about how we do the enforcement. But at the end of the day, there has to be some potential enforcement uh, involved with any of these issues. Otherwise, we're not going to fix these quality of life concerns. Thank you. Uh, so, Dave, do we have more live questions? Oh, yes, many. Uh, go okay. ahead, Jennifer. Hi, Jennifer. Hi. Hi, Aaron. Uh, thanks Hi, for Jennifer. being here tonight. You're welcome. Um, so I've listened to what you've been saying about using sometimes technology, uh, identifying the vehicles. Uh, one thing I wanted to bring up in that regard is that a lot of the residents in our neighborhood are observing that a lot of these vehicles aren't properly registered, aren't properly licensed, they aren't identifiable, like they literally do not have license plates or they have what amount to fake paper tags from out of state. So when you've got vehicles that you can't identify, how are these camera and ticketing tactics, these automated ticketing tactics really gonna make any impact uh, to, to the drivers of those vehicles who aren't just doing things like parking illegally, but they are driving dangerously as other people have already noted. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. We have to address the issue of fake license plates or vehicles that have no license plates. There are also vehicles that use some sort of covering sort of to avoid paying tolls or to obscure their license plate. And the fact of the matter is that you're going to have to have officers out in the field and, uh, and there are license plate scanners on most NYPD vehicles. And when a fake plate is spotted, then that vehicle can be pursued and those uh, vehicle owners can be arrested. In fact, 
It's a timely question, Jennifer, because I think it was last night, and this has been on the news today, New York One and other news outlets, that three drivers were pulled over on, I think, the GW Bridge for having fake tags to avoid tolls. And I think the fact that this happened yesterday and made the news today is no coincidence. And I think the city wanted to make it news to send a message to other people who have other drivers who are using illegal tags that, hey, they might want to put bet, put the real plates back on their cars because if they don't have real plates, then they are subject to fine and or arrest. So the fact of the matter is that we need to create task forces or or groups of officers who go out and sort of um, create a net and then sort of find people who are doing this, um, who, are, who are engaging in these illegalities and get them off the street. I've seen personally, because I've been out campaigning every day, I was in three different neighborhoods in Queens today at different poll sites. And I've seen for myself illegal ATVs and uh, off-road sort of dirt bikes, I guess, for lack of a better term, literally doing wheelies on a public street. And I mean, those, those, uh, those motorists, they are not only putting themselves at risk, but they're putting the safety of others at risk in addition to creating quality of life concerns for local residents. And the fact that people feel like they can just engage in these blatant, blatant illegalities shows how broken um, sort of our laws and enforcement thereof have become. And actually, when I go into minority underserved areas, I don't hear people saying defund the police. And if you look at even a lot of the other quote unquote leading candidates in the race, um, you actually see, you don't hear them saying defund the police. In fact, uh, the one candidate who does, Maya Wiley, she has her own private security car in her neighborhood to keep an eye out. So in fact, we're going to need a lot of law enforcement and I'm hearing it from you tonight and, um, and others across the city that actually people want these laws enforced. And can I just follow up with what other departments and resources in that are already established, would you implement and employ um, so that we've got some real time effective strategies rather than having to create new infrastructure and new tactics that are going to like leave us at the mercy of these issues for another year or two years? It, it, it's a fair question, Jennifer. And, you know, politicians love to stand up and create blue ribbon strike forces, commissions and the like. Uh, but, but in reality, that's a lot of bureaucratic mumbo jumbo oftentimes. Um, so the real work is gonna have to get done and, and we're gonna need a police commissioner who is given the power to, to basically send, send officers out and say, okay, let's address the noise situation with souped up vehicles. Let's actually address this fireworks concern that we have. Let's issue some tickets and get that in the news media. Um, we're gonna need to issue some tickets to motorists who are not using proper license plates and get that in the news media as happened today. So the fact of the matter is, is that we need more organizations like yours bringing attention to those issues. And I know I've heard from people in the comments today and, and from a questioner earlier who said they've been to their uh, precinct chief. Uh, they've been to, they've talked to officers in the area and they're told that their hands are tied. But we need, the fact of the matter is, let's keep having those conversations at the community level, and eventually that will go up the chain, and then hopefully people like me are elected who will actually in turn send the message down the chain as well. So let's keep the conversation going. Let's keep bringing attention to the issue, and hopefully we'll bring the issue up the chain and down and get it done. But I sincerely believe that if we don't address the issue, people like you might get fed up and move out. So um, we need to make sure people stay and preserve our tax base. Thank, Thank you, Aaron. You. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Great questions. Uh, uh, Dave, who do we have next? Uh, Liz wants to ask a question about helicopters. Yes, Liz. Oh, hi. Hi. Um, hi, Liz. I'm Liz Jasicki, and I live on the Upper West Side for 17 years now. Um, 
we've all noticed on the Nextdoor app the increased amount of helicopters going over. People have done counted them on the app and there's sometimes in a day 60, 70 plus helicopters. It's like, feels like Baghdad. And I'm an actor and I have a home recording booth. So I record audiobooks and voiceovers sometimes at home. And I, you simply can't do it. And they, they've also worked that it's not, it's not police. It's nothing official. These are tourists and for personal use. So is there anything that can be done about that? Uh, thank you, Liz. And I can definitely uh, use your services and acting voiceovers and otherwise in connection with my campaign. And so I'll definitely be in touch about that. Um, appreciate the work that you do. Uh, I've done some amateur acting myself, so I can relate. And listen, we, we just have to refocus on the needs of our residents. I want to bring tourist dollars here more than anyone else. But the amount of revenue that the city gets from these helicopter tourist companies is minuscule compared to the city budget. And it turns out that a lot of these helicopters have been coming from New Jersey, and that's the loophole that allows them to then fly into our airspace. And, and in fact, uh, there was a tragedy a year or two ago with one of these doors off helicopter tours where people are, your legs are dangling out the helicopter doors and you're kind of chained in somehow the helicopter crashed and people drowned in that helicopter because they couldn't get out the the loophole was those helicopters were coming from new jersey so listen we just need a cross-state coalition between new jersey and new york to get the handle on this listen we can have some Tourist flights, I'm open to some flights in the right place. People can go to an airport in White Plains and then fly into the periphery of maybe the city somewhere and then back. But we don't need helicopters hovering over uh, the Upper West Side or here near me in, in Battery Park City, where this is also an issue. Yeah. So I appreciate it, Liz, for the question. And... We need to engage on the issue and I appreciate your advocacy with respect to it. You can keep to the water, the water around the island. You get a better view of Manhattan anyway, but I, you know, I don't know. They I don't get it. We don't have helicopter landing pads in the middle of the city anymore. It's illegal to land a chopper yeah. on the top of a building on 7th Avenue the because of an accident. In the 30s on each side of the island. But right. So we can have limited helipad use and people can stay over the water. Absolutely. That would be great. You can do something about that. Thank you, Liz. I can't do my job. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Liz. Great yeah. question. Thank you. Yes, Dave. Who do we have next? Uh, Bernard Grobman is next. Okay. One moment. Just have to wait. There we go. Okay. Hi, Bernard. How are you doing? Um, nice to see you, Aaron. Thank um, you, Bernard. Okay, my question is, um, I'm trying to, and I'm trying to put this together. Okay, so, uh, and I think I've asked this in a few other places. Um, Brooklyn Heights, Riverdale, uh, Forest Hills, right? All neighborhoods in which many of the activities that go on in this neighborhood in Washington Heights would be stopped immediately by the police, which means that the laws are not enforced equally across all the different neighborhoods in the city. And uh, I was wondering, and I'm not sure that it, they ever have been. And um, so I was wondering, what would you do to, to try to rectify that? It's a fair question, Bernard. I appreciate it. Um, when I get in office, I'm going to put a police commissioner in there and it's going to be someone new. I'll be taking resumes from um, civilians and, and officers across the country to find the right person to lead our NYPD because we, we need to enforce laws appropriately and fairly to make sure you strike the right balance. And I'd love to hear from you, Bernard, or anyone else in a, in a future question that might come up as your theory as to why 
some of these quality of life laws are not enforced equally, um, are not enforced adequately in Inwood and Washington Heights when they may be enforced in other places. I can tell you that here in the financial district, I live on the 25th floor uh, of, of, my, of my building. I'm in a rent stabilized apartment. And even here on the 25th floor, occasionally in the middle of the night, I hear a loud motorcycle. I hear a loud vehicle. So I do have some quality of life concerns here in our neighborhood, but it sounds like they're much more pervasive in Washington Heights and Inwood for some reason. And I'm a bit puzzled myself as to why our officers are, appear to be unable to enforce those laws. But the fact of the matter is, Inwood and Washington Heights are beautiful places. And I think we can enforce these laws fairly and we can use carrots. We don't have to use sticks. It's like I said earlier, very few fines were issued with respect to masks in the subway, but the vast, vast majority of people are wearing masks now in the subway. Very few fines were issued with respect to uh, social distancing and, and say quarantining when returning from a trip. And, but yet I think most, the vast majority of people who did travel and came back to the city and who were supposed to quarantine, they did. Uh, we had, you know, officers and people following up and they, com they complied with those rules voluntarily. So there are ways that we can do this right. And thank you, Tanya, for the time reminder. No problem. Uh, Dave, I think we're going to circle back to Carlos. Yes, uh, Carlos, I just prompted you to unmute. Uh, yeah, um, I, I, would, I was just uh, very sort of dissatisfied with, with the answer um, and then also with some of the comments that have been posted because uh, they focus solely on, my, on the experience that I shared um, and they sort of revolve around that and not really about my question. My question was about representation. Uh, how are we going to bring the full spectrum of our community's ethnic makeup in order for all of our voices to be heard? That way we can find solutions that take into consideration all of our racial disparities. I am, I, I am yet to hear that answer and, and, and I feel like a lot of uh, just looking at the at the makeup of this group, it, it does not re represent the vast majority of our community's ethnic make makeup. I, I appreciate the question, Carlos, and and I was able to keep a, a little bit of an eye on the comments as well. So I appreciate your engaging on the issue. So one, I think a lot of a lot of the inequalities in in our society it starts with the school system. And I am always appalled when I, when I speak with a voter and I say, you know what? My parents are public school teachers, which is true. My parents are public school teachers and I care deeply about our schools. Some people tell me, well, you know what, Aaron? I don't care about our schools because I don't have kids. Now that's the wrong answer. And if you look at inequalities in our society, one of the biggest area of inequalities is in our school system. Look at the ethnic makeup of some of the top high schools in our city. And the inequalities in our school system, it, per, it perpetuates itself throughout society and into one's adulthood. Most people don't know that we've been testing kids when they're like three, four years old to then to determine whether they are gifted. And that's ridiculous. We need to let kids be kids and we shouldn't have artificial testing, which ends up just benefiting the wealthy who can send their kids to tutoring so that they can get into the best schools. And that then perpetuates inequality further. Another one of my platform ideas is to have, year, have a longer school year. Studies show that minorities and the underprivileged actually keep up fine with wealthy kids during the school year but it's during the long summer break where minority kids and underprivileged kids fall behind. So that's what I would do. And listen, Carlos, you're right. Whoever is the next mayor, and I hope it's me, has a big job on their hands in terms of bringing all communities together. And I can't offer you a silver bullet on that. It's difficult to find a silver bullet on that, but I pledge I'm gonna do the best I can if elected to make sure we bring all communities together. So thank you again, Carlos, for the follow-up. 
Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, uh, I, I would say I, I love the diversity of people we have on this call. Um, we want to make sure that we continue to have these voices. That's why this is community led because we had our own concerns. We want to make sure that these are actually the voices of people in the community uh, who are uh, uh, working to address these issues. Uh, we have one last question for uh, Mr. Follenauer, then we're going to move on to our New York City Comptroller candidates. Uh, but yes, uh, Dave. Yeah, Annette, go ahead. Hi. Can you hear? I think you can hear me. Yes. Um, Hi, Annette. I can hear you. Thanks for joining <laughs> us today. Hi, I was reading about you yesterday, so this is cool. Oh, great. Um, I, um, as a bicycle person and a driver, it is almost impossible to find street parking now because I think a lot of people come from out of town. We have a string of restaurants here on Dykeman Street. And I don't know if they're advertising for people out of town to come into the city and drive. Is there any way for local drivers to have some kind of permit or something to show that they are local and, they, and we get first dibs on parking? I, I don't know how that's done. I think other cities do it. Um, and it's just a question that I've been thinking about. And there are businesses who do park in the day. It seems pretty peaceful in the day. It's still hard to find parking, but um, I know that City Bike has taken up a lot of spaces and the restaurants have. And um, are the restaurants gonna keep those outdoor things permanently? Um, I, it's been in the news, but I don't know what the conclusion was. Uh, thank you, Annette. I appreciate your reading about me and, and sitting through this forum on what's a nice day um, at least for the moment anyway. And you're right, parking is a big issue. There are other cities that have certain residential parking zones. And for anyone, it might be a two hour parking zone. However, if you're a resident and you've applied for the appropriate permit, then you can park for longer durations of time. And maybe there's still street cleaning twice a week or whatever so that people have to uh, sort of share the streets and, sh and so on and so forth. So that's a solution that I'd certainly be willing to look into. We need to make sure we have adequate parking for residents. Uh, I do appreciate what City Bike has done and we need to accommodate all safe modes of transportation. I'm glad you asked about the sidewalk sheds. These are these temporary buildings, many of which are temporary structures, which are basically eyesores on our streets. Now, they were a good idea at the time to get people eating outside and create more space for diners to safely dine. However, not only are they eyesores, they are terribly unsafe. They do not comply with any zoning code that I know of. And, and the zone, zone code, codes of building codes are in place for a reason. It's for our own safety. There have been several instances where cars have pounded into these sidewalk sheds and luckily in both two or three cases that i'm aware of no one was sitting in those sheds at the time otherwise there would be multiple fatalities and i wake up every morning checking the news hoping that there's not uh, a vehicle plowing into one of those sidewalk sheds because there's literally no crash protection for diners so those are going to have to be removed at some point it's the bottom line there thank you for the question and you want to, we want to thank you so much because you, we want to thank you, Aaron Follenauer, for spending this hour with us. Uh, we appreciate that, the time that you gave to this community. As I said, we, we, we need to be heard up here. And by those who showed up tonight, including yourself and R. Chang, who was with us earlier, um, we appreciate having you and seeing that you actually care enough about our community to show up for us tonight. Uh, so we want to thank you so much for your time. And as I said, I will reach out so we can do a little Facebook Live thing with you and, 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 and uh, this coming week to see what we can do. Okay? Thank you very much. I've put my website in the chat. Uh, if you Google Aaron Mayer NYC, you can easily find me. Uh, I also just today released a short film about my campaign. So check that out on my YouTube channel. Again, if you look up Aaron Foldenauer, you'll find that. So thank you, Tanya. Thank you, everyone. And ke let's keep fighting on these issues. Thank you, Aaron. We're going to move on. Thank you so much for having for being here with us. Uh, we're going to move you. on to our controller candidates. Before we do so, I just wanted to 
do a little shout out to our, our uh, other candidates who did not show tonight. Uh, uh, Maya Wiley, Eric Adams, Scott Stringer, Diane Morales, Raymond McGuire, Sean Donovan, uh, Catherine Garcia, uh, Andrew Yang, uh, Curtis Silva, Fernando Mateo. Well, shout out. Hopefully they can join us next time. Thank you, Tanya. Okay. So, yes, Aaron, you're all set. Thank I'm sorry, you. Liz, what were you saying? I think there's some fringe candidate, fresh love boy prince that you forgot to mention. Oh, yes, yes, I'm sorry. Oh, I wouldn't call him friends. Yes, paper boy love prince. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. shout out to paper boy love friend, uh, prince as well. We love you. We're thinking about you. We're going to pour 40 for you. Okay, so... Um, Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, uh, for those who are just joining us, this is our uh, part two of our Uptown Candidates Forum, where we're focusing on quality of life issues. Um, as people who are with us don't need to, you know, uh, be reminded of how these quality of life issues have impacted our community uh, tremendously uh, over the last year and in and, and, and several months, um, including fireworks, dirt bikes, you name it, we've been impacted by it. And we are interested in talking to all of the elected officials during this election season about uh, how they you know, plan to uh, address uh, these issues. And um, uh, my name is Tanya Bonner. I am the chair of the Wahi Inwood Task Force on Noise. We are a uh, community-based uh, task force that organized actually when we couldn't get anything done by the city. So we were not getting uh, any responses. We were not getting any sort of attention to these issues. And so the community organized and said, we're going to uh, organize together and reach out and went to the city agencies and our elected officials and try to work towards some type of accountability about addressing these issues. Um, and I, we are also joined by uh, the people who are helping us pull off this event tonight, David Tom, who's a task force member, who's helping us with the chat. Um, so if you have questions for the comptroller, please put them in the chat as we go along and we will pull from that and we will also ask uh, uh, people to ask their questions live. Hi, Mr. Lander, thank you for joining us. And um, also um, we are joined with by Liz Ritter, um, who will be helping us with uh, many people and helping answer any of your questions. We are also joined by Loria Crowder, who will be our timekeeper um, uh, tonight, and uh, by uh, Cheryl Miller, who is also helping us out. Um, and so uh, with that, what we're going to do is we're going to start out by each of you uh, giving an opening statement. You'll have two minutes to do that. Um, just tell us anything you want to tell us about yourself, your campaign, and anything you want to mention. It's, it's up to you, and then we will get into some questions, and then we will do a closing. Uh, you will do a closing statement. So again, I want to thank David. Is it, can you pronounce your last name? Is it Weeprin? Prin? Weeprin? Oh, I have to unmute you. I'm sorry. I'm going to unmute all of you. Sorry about that. I should have done that earlier. My apologies. So you should be able to unmute yourself now. Okay, great. Yeah, Weprin. Weprin, yes. Thank you so much. So we're joined by David Weprin. Uh, Zach, is it Esco? Esco? Esco. Esco, okay. And Brad Lander. And we will start, we will go in alphabetical order and then switch it up each time. Um, so uh, we, we will start with Zach. Um, just give us your opening statement, two minutes. Yeah, great. So first off, Tanya, thank you to all of you for having us here tonight. Brad, David, it's been forever. Really great to see you guys. <laughs> um, and uh, hope we can do this in person soon. Uh, so my name is Zach Iskell. I've been a public servant now for two decades. My public service started in the Marine Corps. I led troops during some of the heaviest combat of the Iraq war. And I'm very, very proud that I have never left anyone behind, whether it was in combat or out of combat. Um, I spent the last 10 years building a number of businesses, uh, building a nonprofit, the Headstrong Project, that's now one of the leading and largest providers of mental health care in the United States. So when I came home from Iraq and I began to lose more Marines to suicide than I did in combat, I built the Headstrong Project. We're now taking care of 800 to 1,000 veterans every single week. When we abandon our translators, we're doing it again as we leave Afghanistan. Uh, I fought to bring them over here. I uh, met my wife volunteering in the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy. 
uh, served as the deputy director of Javits Medical Center, leading 28 federal, state, and city agencies at the height of COVID, making sure no New Yorker was left behind. And I'm running for city comptroller because uh, this is a position that can get this city working again. Uh, the fact is New York City spends almost $100 billion a year. It's more than 48 out of 50 states. It's almost as much remarkably as the next 15 or 20 largest US cities combined. It's an astronomical amount of money. And that money is not going where it's needed. And so I see the role of comptroller as a role that can help the mayor and help the city council. And we often think about this role as one of holding uh, the mayor and holding the city council accountable. I think that's part of it. I also think there's a huge opportunity to use the office to figure out what is and is not working in the city, where we can be making investments in things that are working and divesting from things that are not working. Uh, and I'm very proud that just a few hours ago, I got the uh, endorsement from the New York Post, specifically because of the things that I want to do with this role to make the city function again and make it work for the people that live here. So thanks for having me here and looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you for being here. It's a wonderful opportunity for us uh, to, to hear from, uh, from you all. Um, next, we're going to hear from Brad Land. Thank you so much, Tanya. And it's great to be here with Liz and everyone. I appreciate your inviting me virtually up to Washington Heights. And I've been up there in person a lot of times. And I look forward to seeing you all again soon. I really like showing up in all the neighborhoods of the city. Um, I've been fighting for New Yorkers for the past 25 years. Uh, for the first 15 years, I led two community development nonprofits uh, that helped bring our neighborhoods back from the abandonment crisis, turning vacant buildings into vibrant storefronts and truly affordable housing at two nonprofits, the Fifth Avenue Committee uh, and the Pratt Center for Community Development. And I was actually the board chair of the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development, which is all nonprofit, community-based organizations, boards controlled by people in the neighborhoods on a real model of community development. And that's why I wanted to be with you tonight. My model for the future of the city is that it's in those kinds of organizations where people step up and lead their neighborhoods uh, and really put forward a vision that we fight together for the future of the city. I've served in the city council for the past 10 years where I've passed legislation to raise pay for workers like fast food workers, car washeros, Uber and Lyft drivers and freelancers uh, to protect tenants by creating a really great certificate of no harassment. And I help bring participatory budgeting to New York City, which has been a great way for people to get involved in making change. Um, in their endorsement of me, the New York Times cited the work I did to get air conditioning in every classroom in the city of New York. That came from middle school students who said it was too hot to learn in their schools. Uh, and we teamed up together, ran a five borough campaign. That's the spirit I'll bring to the controller's office, making as budget watchdog, spending our money smart, as chief accountability officer, holding our agencies accountable for performance performance, and as pension fund manager, holding the companies we invest in accountable both for financial performance and for a fairer economy. I'm proud to be endorsed in this race by the New York Times, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, uh, Nydia Velasquez, Senators Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders, and public advocate Jumani Williams, but the votes I'm most hoping to earn are yours. Thank you for inviting me. No, thank you. We're, we're privileged to have you up here. We thank you for you investing your time in our community. David. Opening state. Yeah, thank you, uh, Tanya. Uh, my name is uh, David Weprin, uh, and I'm running for New York City controller uh, to put the needs of working class and middle class families front and center, and to protect the pensions uh, of, our, our, of our over 700,000 uh, retirees in the city of New York, uh, which one of which includes my 91 year old mother, uh, who is a Cuban immigrant uh, to this country. Uh, became uh, a public high school teacher. Uh, she has a pension uh, that, uh, that I'd like to protect. Uh, I'm also running for controller to help uh, bring us out of what's gonna be uh, the worst fiscal crisis in the history of the city of New York. Uh, thanks to uh, aid from Washington, uh, we, uh, we are gonna be okay with this upcoming city budget, but we're anticipating multi-billion dollar deficits for the next uh, possibly four or five years, uh, possibly four to $5 billion every year. Uh, and uh, that could be a disaster for our city. And I'm committed to um, earning uh, over 7% for our uh, pensioners because if we fall below 7%, uh, the city general budget has to make up the difference. They're guaranteed 7%. Uh, and as a result, uh, we're gonna get the city into uh, even worse uh, fiscal crisis. So. Uh, uh, I'm committed to um, using the audit function uh, to tackle on um, 
the outside contracting budget of the city of New York, which is now about 20% uh, of the budget. And we have some very large contracts that have never been audited, uh, like the uh, Bronx Parent Housing Network, where we saw the corruption uh, in, in the Bronx, uh, but run by uh, uh, Victor Rivera, and uh, that could have been discovered in a routine uh, audit. So uh, I believe I have the background, both public and private sector finance experience to help us get out of this fiscal mess. And that's why I'm running for controller. Awesome. Thank you so much. So we're going to, again, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. Uh, I wanted to have the controller candidates here because um, we don't get to hear from them. And it's like a mysterious position, right? A lot of people don't know what, you, what the position is and what it does. And people are going to have to go vote if they haven't started already. So know who you're voting for, understand the position and what they can do for your community. That is so important. So that's all we're gonna open with this question. Please explain the role of the comptroller. Uh, those who might not be familiar with it, what is it that you do and what areas of concern can you impact in this role? And we will start uh, with, with Zach. Sorry, uh, keep it, it, yeah. You can keep yourself unmuted if you can. If you can, if not, I can unmute you. Yeah, I somehow I got well. Okay, great. Anyways, we're here. Um, so I uh, appreciate you asking that question because it's an important one. A lot of people don't know what the comptroller does. There's a lot of functions that exist under the comptroller's office. Everything from setting prevailing wage, settling claims against the city, um, uh, managing the Bureau of Asset Management, which is responsible for managing the five pension funds. Uh, auditing city agencies. Um, so there's a whole host of responsibilities. I'm sure David and Brad can add a few more that fall under the comptroller's office. Uh, one of the things that I sort of see differently about the role is the role that the comptroller can play in helping really solve problems. I've been a problem solver in my two decades of public service. I've been in situations where I have seen government failing. Uh, First Marine I lost in Iraq. Uh, we went to a misguided war without armor on our Humvees. We had to figure out how to armor our Humvees. We had to figure out how to keep ourselves safe in an incredibly dangerous environment. When I came home and we were failing to care for our veterans, I had to build a treatment program to do that. At the height of COVID, when this city was failing to care for New Yorkers, I had to figure out how to get 28 federal, state, and city agencies to work together. Um, I have done this in business, in nonprofits, in government. I am a problem solver. And I think there is a huge role that the controller can play, not only in auditing city agencies, not only in looking for waste, fraud, abuse, and corruption within the city, but really digging in, really figuring out what is and isn't working so that we can um, solve problems. You know, you look at uh, homelessness. Um, you know, you're not gonna solve homelessness by an auditing the Department of Homeless Services. There's 16 different agencies in the city of New York that touch homelessness. The only way that you're gonna solve homelessness is by diving in and looking at what is working to keep people out of homelessness? What is working to get people out of homelessness? There's a program the city runs, a home-based program. That's an incredibly effective program. There's 55 cities around the US that have ended veterans homelessness. There's 15 that have ended homelessness. How have they done it? What can we learn? And then working in partnership with the next mayor and the next city council to actually make those investments to solve problems. Thank you. And so next we'll ask uh, Brad the same question. Describe the role and how it could be impactful in different areas. So I think of it primarily in sort of three buckets, budget watchdog, chief accountability officer, and fiduciary, both with the specific sense of managing the pension funds for public sector workers, but also more generally in taking the long-term view on the city. So first is budget watchdog, and that means digging in both before the mayor and the council passed the budget, and then following up on every dollar. Right now, the most important thing is gonna be make sure that American Rescue Plan money gets spent wisely and efficiently to reopen our city, get our schools back open, support small businesses, prevent people from getting evicted, um, and promote a more equitable economy than the one we had. I am sponsoring legislation in the city council to create an American Rescue Plan spending tracker. Right now, it is not easy to track every dollar of the money that we're getting from Washington, make sure we spend it wisely, but also that we don't create long-term obligations with one-time money. So I'll be strong chief budget watchdog. As chief accountability officer, I'll use the auditing tools of the office to make New York City government work better. You know, that is the goal, not dusty tomes on a shelf you, or not one day headlines in the, 
in the Post or the, or the newspapers, but how do you actually make government work better? So I've laid out a, a comprehensive plan for how I'll use the Audits Bureau of the Comptroller's Office. You can check it out at landerfornyc.com slash audits. Um, I propose some new kinds of audits, looking at capital projects management, looking at disability and language access, looking at issues of racial and economic equity and sustainability. And then the third function of fiduciary, I hope we'll talk a little more about, that's both making sure there's retirement security for retired teachers and nurses and firefighters, but you're also the one person who's assigned to take the long-term view on the city. You know, we didn't see the COVID crisis coming and we've paid in the lives of th over 30,000 of our neighbors, but we can all see the climate crisis coming. The controller's job is to pay attention to long-term risks and get us more ready to face them. Thank you. Thank you for that explanation. David, what is yes. your take on what your role? What is this? What is this position? Well, it's uh, it's a little it's unknown uh, to a lot of people, but it's it's probably the most uh, important uh, unknown position, uh, especially at this very critical time. There are actually fourteen units uh, in the controller's office and two separate offices uh, in in the controller's office itself. So it's it's very broad, but I would view the uh, primary responsibility. Uh, to be a check uh, over the mayor and the mayor's agencies. Uh, and the major part of that would be the audit function. And as I said earlier, uh, it's important to uh, audit uh, city agencies as well as uh, large outside contracts. Uh, the city charter only requires uh, the controller to audit some aspect of every city agency once every four years. Uh, that's certainly uh, not enough. I would look to audit every agency uh, every year and if it means hiring more auditors, so, so be it. The uh, auditing unit is actually the largest unit in the controller's office. It's got 150 employees, over 100 auditors. Uh, and I think it's, it's not fully used properly. And I'd like to see uh, more frequent audits. There's also the debt issuance function, uh, something I know a lot about because I was on Wall Street for 25 years in municipal finance, uh, floating bond issues for infrastructure, for housing, uh, for hospitals, for schools, uh, and that's directly relevant. That is the job uh, of the controller in the uh, public finance uh, division. Uh, you do enforce prevailing wage, uh, but um, there, there are a lot of very important functions, but uh, I would view the role as, as a check and balance uh, with the mayor uh, and, uh, and play that, uh, that role. I, I also look at the role of helping uh, bring the city back to financial health and uh, I believe my background, I chaired the finance committee of the city council for eight years. I was deputy commissioner of banking for the state for four years and I was on Wall Street for 25 years uh, to play a major role uh, in bringing the city back uh, from a potential financial disaster uh, in the uh, upcoming budgets after this one. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Okay, so we're gonna start with you, David, for our question. I believe David, Dave, Tom, we have a live question from one of our attendees. Yes, Jennifer, go ahead. Hi, candidates. Thanks for being here tonight. Uh, I'm very interested in hearing how you would use the Office of the Comptroller to address the quality of life issues that are affecting Upper Manhattan, as well as areas of Brooklyn, Queens, the Bronx, at epidemic levels. The quality of life issues that are unrelenting in our area include cars with loudly modified exhaust and sound systems, ATV and dirt bike and scooters that are driving through our parks on our sidewalks and against traffic rules, and all of these vehicles driving recklessly. Uh, we've got amplified sound systems in our neighborhoods after hours, fireworks being set off nightly, rampant theft of packages in our building lobbies and more. Uh, looking at these issues through the lens of the comptroller's power of the audit, why is this not an issue in other areas of the city, such as the Upper East Side, Greenwich Village, Tribeca? And what agencies would you target and audit to help address these quality of life issues that are seemingly being ignored by every resource that we as residents feel that we have access to? Thank you. Thank you for that great question, Jennifer. David. Yeah, well, actually, uh, we have a lot of those same noise problems in Queens. I've represented uh, Queens County uh, for almost 20 years, uh, eight years in the city council, uh, now 11 and a half years uh, in the assembly. Uh, one of our major noise problems uh, are uh, airplane noise. And, and we've done a lot of uh, work with uh, various task force involving, uh, you know, the federal government, the, the state government. Uh, we have an aviation caucus uh, in the city council. 
we have a major problem with fireworks. Last uh, summer uh, was probably the worst uh, summer, not even the summer. It was. It, it started, I think, uh, before the summer. I started during the pandemic and we had fireworks uh, every night uh, for a very, very long period of time. And, uh, you know, something has to be done uh, like that. So it's not just unique to uh, your area in Manhattan. It's really uh, probably, you know, it, the entire city. And uh, that was probably one of my constituents' major complaint. You know, I think uh, we really need uh, more police enforcement uh, of some of these uh, quality of life, uh, you know, situations. And uh, obviously we, you know, we, we have to worry about public safety, but at the same time, uh, you know, quality of life crimes and noise uh, as is, you know, happening all over, uh, I think it's something that uh, we have to, uh, you know, get the uh, the police department uh, directly involved in. Thank you. Thank you, David. Okay, we're going to go to Brad Lander. Thank you so much for this question. So I'm really excited about the possibility of using the tools of the controller's office to support work on resident quality of life. Uh, then that begins by really getting feedback from people themselves. So actually, I'm going to drop in the chat now a model that I've committed in that audits platform to use, um, a kind of New York City resident feedback survey that was conducted by the Citizens Budget Commission of New York. Um, uh, it's actually been conducted twice, once by the city back in 2008, and then once by the Citizens Budget Commission. I want to do that from the controller's office. And if you go take a look, you'll see it lets you look and see by different neighborhoods what are the problems that people are really facing? Where are they similar across neighborhoods? And where do some neighborhoods really have particular problems of, you know, in some cases, lack of parks cleanliness or a range of other things. But obviously noise is one of the things that makes it hardest for people to live in New York City. And I take it really seriously. Um, one of the noise issues in my community is from helicopters. Um, and I've actually introduced legislation in the city council to try to require the New York City Department of uh, the New York City Economic Development Corporation, together with the health department, to put together a, a survey that tries to evaluate. So, you know, when EDC comes before the council, they say, we collect a few taxes and there's a few jobs, and we don't really measure the misery created from the helicopter noise. And so we've actually teamed up with some public health experts to say, you actually could and should measure that because if you're making it impossible for people to sleep, if you're making people miserable, you're having real measurable impacts on the city. So I've got a piece of legislation that would require that. And as controller, I wanna work with residents like you to figure out how do we evaluate these challenges in different neighborhoods? How do we measure in really quantifiable ways? As controller, the audits have to have objective measures, uh, but there's a lot of ways to think objectively about what diminishes health, about what creates, you know, sleep, you know, challenging conditions of sleep. Obviously, you can measure noise in decibels and then really dig in. You know, it's not the controller that can fix the problems, but the controller can work with communities to shine a spotlight on them, organize together to demand answers and pressure agencies for real change. Awesome. Thank you for that answer. Now we're going to have uh, Zach respond to Jennifer's question. Yeah, Jennifer, um, thank you for the question. Uh, the question gets to the heart as to one of the reasons, uh, the primary reason why I am running for city council. Uh, the fact is the city stopped working for us. Uh, it is no longer working for people in this city. It's working for itself. Uh, city spending has increased by almost $30 billion over the last seven years. Uh, $30 billion. That's three times the budget of LA County. It's an astronomical amount of money. And what did we get for it? Our streets are not cleaner. They're not safer. Uh, class sizes haven't gotten smaller in our schools. In fact, they've gotten larger. Uh, we could have gotten universal broadband. We didn't. We could have made public transportation free. As somebody who considers himself a classic fiscal conservative social liber liberal, we have failed on both fronts. Uh, and nowhere is that more clear in quality of life issues. Um, and so part of what I want to do with the office is get the city into the business of solving specific problems. Scott Stringer, uh, each year during the course of his audits, uh, I think last year only identified about $32 million in savings. $32 million in savings on a last year $92 billion budget. That's not even pennies. And I think part of the reason for that is because the way that we currently do this audit function, and this is one of the reasons that I'm, I'm so intently focused on changing the audit function from auditing singular agencies to auditing a holistic response, 
uh, is because if you don't know what your goal is, if you don't know what your outcome is, it is impossible to know what you are spending money effectively on and what you are wasting money on. And so when it comes to these quality of life issues, whether it's reducing noise pollution, uh, whether it's making our streets safer and cleaner, whether it's getting homeless off our streets into the programs that they need, we've got to look at those specific issues that are often interconnected and then audit the city's holistic response to that to provide the city council and the mayor, the police department, other agencies, the tools and information they need to actually then start solving these problems for us. Thank you so much for that answer. And thank you, Jennifer, for that wonderful question. We appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, so Dave, I understand we have more live questions and this time we're gonna start with Zach. Um, so yes, what's the next one? Uh, yeah, Maggie, I just asked you to unmute. So go ahead with your question on Zoom. Okay, um, my video uh, isn't working, but that's all right. Uh, this question has to do with quality of life and death in this uh, area of the, uh, okay, I can start my video now. <laughs> um, so how and when will you audit the impacts of the various rezonings? In Inwood, the upzoning will add over 10,000 people to our population plus their cars and that's gonna have an impact on the streets. The environmental impact statement clearly predicted that most of our intersections will be a letter grade F where E is full capacity. And that will impact ambulances, fire trucks, buses, truck deliveries, and I imagine horn honking and uh, air pollution, um, you know, climate change, I could add more. The city makes promises in exchange for allowing 30 story buildings to be built in the floodplain of our six story neighborhood. That's going to have impacts too. How will you as controller be able to protect Inwoodites from the worst impacts of the ill conceived up zoning? Yes, Zach? Yeah. Um, Maggie, thank, thank you, you, Maggie. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Maggie, for that question. I get uh, that question or similar questions all over New York City. Um, it's, it is a huge issue. And um, the fact is, Maggie, I don't have a good answer for you because we already know what those assessments are, right? In many ways, a lot of these audits have already been done. Um, and it shows a real shortcomings in the leadership of the city that we don't have leadership that's actually listening to communities and the people who live in those communities. And so I would say to you, Maggie, is, is like what we need to do is on starting last Saturday, going through June 22nd, is start voting to get adults in the room who are going to listen to communities that know what's happening. I mean, I was meeting with some firefighters a couple of weeks, you know, I'm a huge fan of, 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 of outdoor dining, um, but nobody's talking about the impact it's had, and you brought this up uh, in your question, nobody's talking about the impact it's actually had on response times for firefighters and for ambulances, right? Like, you know, these things are sort of not being included in these political discussions. And so what I can say to you, Maggie, is that if I was fortunate enough to get your vote, you would have somebody who is advocating for you at the highest levels of government, somebody who would be making sure that these issues are acknowledged and that they're seeing the light of day. Um, but in terms of the audit function, look, I think there is some work that the comptroller can play in helping identify some of these issues. But the fact is, we already know what they are. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zach, for that answer. Brad, your response to Maggie's question. Thank you, Maggie, for this important question. So the, you know, the controller does not have a formal role in the land use process. You don't have an appointment to the uh, city planning commission like the borough presidents or even the, bub the public advocate does. You don't get to vote on the, on the land use process. So it's not a direct land use role. But an area that I think the controller could play a very strong role in is around infrastructure and capital projects and commitments around infrastructure and capital projects because the controller does have a Bureau of Engineering, uh, does the public finance for infrastructure investments, and every year when the budget rolls around can dig in on the capital budget in a way that we really don't. And in the city council, I've been the biggest champion for capital projects management reform, digging in not just on the expense budget, our you know, now $100, million, $100 billion expense budget, but every year we authorize about $10 billion in new capital spending, and there's just very little scrutiny on it. And that begins with thinking about our 10-year capital strategy, where you should be able to see what is going on with 
where there's new infrastructure investments, where there's school investments, where there's parks investments, are those corresponding to where growth is taking place and where rezonings have been or not? Are we doing anything to evaluate the sufficiency of the infrastructure relative to the land use plans and development? So that's my plan. I actually passed a bill last year in the council um, to start requiring a universal capital projects tracking system, which right now does not exist. Uh, I'm on the advisory board that is demanding that it get created. It's supposed to get created this year so that when I'm in the office of controller, you'll be able to come to me and say, we need to talk about our infrastructure. It's not sufficient here, here, and here. They allowed this much new growth, but they didn't do anything to address these infrastructure challenges and our capital projects aren't being ma managed in ways to deliver them. So that's not gonna solve all the land use problems because the controller does not have a role in that process, but it is a really strong role of the controller's office in addressing issues of growth and infrastructure sufficiency. Thank you, Brad, for that explanation. David. Yeah, well, the, uh, the upzoning problem is a problem not only in your area, but really throughout the city. Uh, and um, as I uh, go through the process of auditing every agency, uh, there are so many agencies that actually have uh, a major role uh, in the upzoning uh, and in, you know, in, the, in the whole uh, land use process. Uh, city Planning Commission, uh, is a city agency uh, that can be audited and we can deal with how they uh, handle some of these projects, whether it be in your neighborhood or throughout the city. Uh, the fire department has an aspect, uh, you know, in, in, in growth and, and uh, issuing regulations, the uh, um, environmental protection uh, department, the buildings department is probably one of the departments I get uh, the most complaints about uh, as, as a legislator, both in the city council and the assembly. Uh, they're very int intimately involved uh, in the zoning process and the upzoning. So uh, I would make it my business to, uh, to look at some of those issues uh, through the uh, regular audits of uh, various city agencies that affect uh, the zoning uh, in the city. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Uh, okay, so thank you, Maggie, for your question. We'll move on to the next uh, live question, Dave. Uh, yeah. Deborah Barrett, I'm trying to uh, get you unmuted. And we're going to start with you, David, for this one. Okay. All right. I, I just want to thank and echo what uh, Jennifer Mahler just said in the questions that she put to you a few moments ago. The issues that she had raised uh, are issues that really affect northern Manhattan, and they're, they're quite serious. Um, but I did want to ask, uh, what are the key differences between how you would handle the issues facing the comptroller's office and how Scott Stringer has handled them? And most importantly, I was going to ask about the homeless crisis, but having heard all of you in between the, uh, what Jennifer asked and now, how would you set up a system so that uh, uh, voters, uh, residents of New York can actually access you and your office. Not just that we would email you because it goes to the foggy bottom. We never hear back. Um, what, is there a way that you could set up, each one of you have a plan on how we can uh, make our voices known directly to your office? Uh, that And the other question that I had that's related, would there be would it be possible, for instance, in the New York Times or some other publication that uh, affects the city to actually itemize what the Comptroller Office does and how it is important to the city? Okay. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to start uh, with, De uh, I'm sorry, with, um, with Zach for that. Um, um, I, I think they sort of addressed at the beginning a little bit about what their roles are. Um, so maybe you can skip that and, and maybe get to the other parts of her question. Um, yeah, so Deborah, so in, in terms of an itemized um, sort of list of the responsibilities of the Comptroller's Office, it's actually on the, the Comptroller's website. I can, I can put it in, in the chat, but if you go to the Comptroller's website, uh, they do a good job of, base, of, of describing the basics of what the responsibilities are. Uh, you can also look at the city contract, the city charter, um, which lays it as, out as well. There's actually not a whole lot of chapters dedicated to the Comptroller's Office, but it's all in there. 
um, as well to sort of understand what the exact responsibilities are. Um, and then forgive me, the other part of your question, you asked about the uh, itemized responsibilities of the office. Look, I will commit right now to doing weekly office hours. Um, it's something that actually one of the mayoral candidates, uh, Art Chang is doing on the campaign trail. I think it's a brilliant idea. I have my cell phone number on all of my handles on our website for people to be able to text message me directly. I use an app to manage text messaging at scale, but it do, does come right to me and I will continue to use that as Comto to make sure that I have an open line of communication. And I think that's really important. Uh, you know, General Eisenhower famously said, uh, it's really easy to be a farmer um, when you're thousands of miles from a cornfield and your hoe is a pencil, you know, when you're sitting in office. And I think similarly, we need people who are going to be out on the ground, uh, about out and about in the city, actually looking at what is and isn't working. Um, you know, some of the best ideas I've gotten about how to end the plague of gun violence in New York City has been actually just spending time in some of the communities most impacted by gun violence and spending time with young kids who have been impacted by gun violence and some of the groups that are working to fight gun violence, whether it's police officers, violence interrupters, or others. They are the ones closest to the problems. People closest to the problem always have the best solution. And as comptroller, that's the type of leader I was in the Marine Corps. That's the type of leader I've been in nonprofits, in business, at Javits. Uh, it is the type of leadership I will also bring to the city to make sure that um, you know, we have a boots on the ground view of what the real issues are. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zach and Brad. Thanks, Tanya. This is a, a really important question. As I mentioned in my opening, you know, I spend more time working in nonprofit community development than I still have in public office. And in that, what I learned is you organize and work together with people on the ground if you want to make change. Change does not come because you elect someone to office who's going to then like go off like the Wizard of Oz. You need a partnership between organizing and community-based voices on the outside and people listening and using their tools on the inside. That's what I've done in the city council. As I mentioned, I brought participatory budgeting to New York City, which is a way not just of listening and having me listen to people about what changes, you know, what investments they want, but creating a system in which tens of thousands of people have an opportunity to say, here's the improvements that we need, um, and then be in direct dialogue with me around them. You know, I mentioned those middle school students. Uh, it was one class of middle school students at first who said, councilman, it's too hot to learn in our classroom. We put it on the ballot for participatory budgeting, it won. Then the next year, another set of middle school students came back and we said, well, how many classrooms are there? And then we conducted an audit. We got the city to give data that it had never given before. And the answer was 12,000 classrooms that didn't have air conditioning where it was too hot to learn. So then we teamed up. Now we have the audit and we have the folks on the outside organizing and we built a campaign to make change. Um, that's how I've done the job in the council. And that's what I want to do uh, in the comptroller's office as well. The audits platform that I've dropped in the chat has a whole section on participatory style audits from that resident survey that I mentioned, which let you know to audits where you team up with people and say, how are we gonna get a, um, a stakeholder team involved here? Maybe even a citizen jury. You still have to use audits that have objective standards where you're measuring things that can be measured objectively, but there's no reason that you can't get to work together with people in every, you know, in every one of the, of the functions of the office and have laid out real detailed plans for how to do that. And I'd love to stay engaged with you through the process. Thank you, Brad. Th uh, we're gonna go with David to answer uh, Deborah's question. Yeah, thank you, Tanya. Uh, I'm committed um, to, uh, especially post-pandemic, uh, post-COVID-19, uh, to open up uh, five borough offices uh, to help liaisons uh, to the community uh, and to help small businesses come back. Over 50% uh, of our jobs in New York City are from small businesses. Uh, in the case of the boroughs outside of Manhattan, I will open up an office there. In the case of Manhattan, uh, you know, we have 760 employees um, in the controller's office, all in the municipal building. Uh, I think it would be appropriate to open up uh, an uptown office uh, closer to your neighborhood because uh, the downtown office uh, is probably as far uh, from parts uh, of Manhattan uh, as, it, as it is from the other boroughs. So uh, I, would, I would add an upper Manhattan office to those other borough offices focusing on small businesses and dealing with financial services uh, in underserved communities, but also uh, dealing with um, accessing uh, aid 
uh, whether they, or programs, whether they be federal, state, or city programs, many of which have uh, been created or expanded uh, by the legislature, by Congress uh, with COVID-19. Uh, and I think those borough offices could be more focused on liaison uh, with the community. Uh, there is a unit in the controller's office dealing with that. I think it might be better in, it spread out uh, in different offices so it could be more uh, closer to the, uh, to the various communities. So uh, that's something uh, I'm committed to uh, as service and I will uh, travel between those offices uh, as needed so people can make appointments uh, and actually uh, meet with me uh, when it's convenient uh, for them to get there. Okay, thank you, David. Thank you, Deborah, for your question. We really appreciate it. Uh, people don't understand how important of a role that the Comptroller has and the issues that we care about. So we're learning that tonight. Uh, David, we're gonna start with you for this next question. Um, enormous sums of, sums of money are being poured into 311 and city agencies to record, track, and respond to noise issues. And yet, clearly, the system is not working given both the continuing high number of complaints in our neighborhoods and the lack of resolutions. How would you, as controller, audit the city agencies to make the process of dealing with noise issues more fiscally efficient, effective, and equitable? Can you speak to the controller's wor uh, role in auditing DOT and 311 to ensure that calls to 311 are acted on in a prompt manner and are not closed out until they are actually resolved. So let's yeah. talk about that and we will start with David. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, as a city legislator and a state legislature, almost 20 years, uh, we've had a lot of complaints, uh, you know, about, uh, you know, 311s and, and tracking it. And uh, I always took the position as a, as a city legislator or a state legislator uh, that we're better off uh, having the legislator, uh, you know, contact uh, the agencies directly because, uh, for whatever reason, it might have been a good idea on the uh, the three one one, but uh, you know, just the tracking and the follow up, uh, you know, lacks uh, a lot of uh, desire to, uh, you know, to be responsive uh, to the public. So, uh, uh, as I said, I want to uh, audit uh, every agency uh, every year and some of the larger outside contracts. So uh, certainly um, 311 and, and DOT uh, are part of, uh, part of that. And, and uh, I, there's a lot of overlap, as, as was pointed out, between agencies. And that's why uh, it can't just be dealing with one agency. There's different aspects, but uh, those are the type of things that will come out uh, in the audit. And I, I think um, it's important to, to save money in these audits, and that would actually justify uh, hiring more auditors, which would enable us to do a more frequent audits. And, uh, you know, I agree with uh, Zach uh, that the amount of money that's been saved, uh, you know, um, over the years uh, through these audits has not, is not enough. And if every agency was audited in some of these large outside contracts, uh, we'd be looking at uh, a lot more than uh, $32 million in savings. I would predict it would be in the hundreds and hundreds of millions, possibly a billion dollars in savings, just dealing with some of these large outside contracts, dealing with some of the inefficiencies in some of these agencies. So that's something I would certainly make a priority as controller. Thank you, David. Brad? I will definitely uh, audit 311. It's an essential, you know, uh, for our city in so many ways, and we have to know about response times. Obviously, the 311 data itself is a critical component of evaluating the city and needs to be, in many cases, used as a sort of context for controller audits. But if you're going to do that, you have to be able to rely on it. You have to know the data is solid. You know, you speak to these issues that you mentioned at the top about noise complaints and other quality of life complaints. If 311 is not being used, you know, both to solve an individual problem, right? Someone calls and says, right now, there's, you know, extremely loud party going on outside our door, or the drag racing. You wanna make sure that the problem is solved, but also that the magnitude of the issue in a particular neighborhood is captured so that you're then following up at neighborhood scale. And that's what 311 has to be. Um, so I absolutely will work with you and, and others to make sure it can fulfill that function, uh, both so we know response time, so individual cases get addressed 
and so that the broader data about issues facing neighborhoods is solid and can be used as part of the background for auditing broader city agencies. Um, I really want to apologize. I, I have to run. I see Zach's got one of his family members there uh, with him. And I also, my folks have come to town to try to help me down the stretch. And so uh, I'm going to jump now. But I really appreciate what you guys are doing here. And I think your point that the controller's office needs to be an ally to neighborhoods on a broad range of issues as we look at agency audits uh, is really critical. And I appreciate you taking the time to invite us. And I look forward to being up there in person with you very soon. Thank you so much, Brad. We appreciate having you here today. Have so thank day. you so much. Thank yes. You. OK, so now we will. Uh, get to Zach and I'll unmute you. Okay, great. Brad, it's great to see you. Uh, say, tell your parents I say hello. I'm definitely cheating the system here with uh, using an adorable kid. <laughs> You're gonna have to bring your grandkids into the chat at some point. Um, this one is uh, begging me to uh, read uh, Harry Potter to him. So okay. here, here. Um, you know, we're on- We're almost three. there. We're almost we're there. Three, Wolf. We're in book three. Um, Look, I, I love this question. And uh, this question gets to the heart of why I'm running for Comptroller, uh, because the city's not working on solving problems. Um, we are not going to solve a problem like noise pollution simply by auditing 311 or just by auditing the um, uh, Department of Transportation. We have to get into the business. Look, we know these problems that the city's facing are deeply interconnected. Um, and solving them requires cooperation Synchroniz synchronization of effort across city agencies. The reason I'm so focused of the, on this is, you know, one of my mentors is a guy named General Stanley McChrystal. Uh, General McChrystal in 2005 famously transformed uh, our Joint Special Operations Command, taking a siloed approach to war fighting and forcing multiple different agencies from the State Department uh, to Department of Homeland uh, Security, even the NYPD, uh, the CIA, the NSA, uh, and multiple military organizations to work together in concert on the ground. We have to do that city government as well. And so if you look at something like noise pollution, like uh, drag racing, simply auditing a specific agency does not get to the heart of the problem and does not help the city solve that problem. And so instead what you need to do is you need to look at what is the city's holistic response across 311, across the NYPD, uh, across the Department of Transportation, uh, across working with community boards and talking to people in communities to actually solve this issue. And once you do that, it becomes very, very clear what you need to do to actually solve it and how to get city agencies to work together uh, to solve that specific problem. And that's not just about noise pollution. You can extend that to anything from the number of homeless on our streets to uh, gun violence uh, to a problem like dyslexia in schools, right? Uh, that is a barrier to kids learning. So you focus on the specific problem and then you audit the holistic response to actually solving it. And that's how you actually end up with outcomes. That's how you find out what we should and should not be spending more money on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zach. So we're going to start with you for this next question. Okay. We're almost done. That, uh, so we appreciate uh, you all being with here with us today. Just want to make sure we get as many questions from the community as possible while we have you. Okay, so the next one is, back in 2018, State Controller Thomas Dinopoli uh, released a report about noise in the city, uh, citing it as a major challenge. Uh, do you think you would, uh, that your office would like to take up a study of this nature? Like, what do you think is the next step for, is there an opportunity to study specifically that your office could take up an, a current study of this whole uh, uh, issue of noise in the city uh, that was, done several years ago uh, on the state by the state. Um, so what do you see as being a possible in terms of a study with you through your office? Zach? Um, I mean, short answer, yes. Uh, I think it's incredibly important. I was just up actually in, um, in uh, Northern Harlem today, um, uh, knocking on doors. And um, it was one of the number one complaints I heard from people knocking on doors. Um, and so this is a problem. I think that absolutely we could take that assessment and um, do one that is uh, uh, up to date, um, looking at the problems of noise pollution and how it affects everything from people's health, uh, mental health, physical health, uh, property values, um, safety issues. 
um, and ways that we could, I don't want to sound like I'm, I'm beating, a bet, beating a dead horse here, but ways that we can holistically work to solve these issues of noise pollution, which are very, very real. Yes, thank you. David, what about a study? Is that something that you think we should be doing now? Or uh, absolutely, doing absolutely. And uh, I would make it my business to work uh, closely uh, with the state controller, uh, especially when there's overlapping because uh, obviously uh, the city of New York is uh, part of the state. So a lot of the state audits on those type of uh, issues uh, would be relevant to the city. You know, another area where we could do joint audits, um, you know, on a totally different issue is the MTA because uh, the MTA is a state agency, but at the same time, um, you know, it affects the city in some ways more because, uh, you know, the transportation system that we rely on, uh, the, the buses, the subways, uh, really service uh, New York City residents more than it does uh, state residents. So that's a perfect example of how the state and the city should really work together. Uh, on on these audits and uh, and you know for performance as well as uh, you know just overall uh, you know uh, findings uh, so uh, that that's certainly uh, another area uh, that I would certainly work uh, with the controller's office state controller's office on. Great, thank you. Okay, so so now what we're going to do since we're almost at time, we're going to have you all just give a closing statement. Um, you know about. Anything you want to tell us about, tell the potential voters here. Uh, so, and we will start with Zach. Um, so first off, thank you all for hosting us. Thank you for being involved in the civic process. Uh, not enough New Yorkers are. This is one of the most consequential elections in the history of New York City. We're already in it. Uh, the primary isn't June 22nd. The last day of voting is June 22nd. And the only way we're gonna turn the page on this city is by getting the right leadership in place. Um, personally, I think David Weprin would make a fantastic comptroller. Uh, unfortunately, he is also an incredibly legis legislator up in Albany, and we need his leadership to remain in Albany. So let's keep David Weprin in Albany. And, uh, and uh, my son's turning the lights on and off. He doesn't agree with me, Weprin. You've got Wolf's vote. Um, <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> you know, I think one of the things that we do have to look at when we're evaluating our public servants is uh, the best indicator of future performance is past performance. Uh, in my two decades career in public office, I've never left anyone behind, whether it was in combat or out of combat. And we unfortunately live in a city that is leaving far too many communities behind, far too many neighbors behind, far too many New Yorkers behind. And we have the resources in New York City to do otherwise. We have the resources and potential in this city to solve big problems. If we wanted to, we could end homelessness in New York City. If we wanted to, we could have, uh, um, we could be leading the way on ending gun violence in our city. If we wanted to, we could be closing the education gap and showing what a world-class education looks like for every single child. Instead of two, instead two out of 10 kids, two, only two out of 10 kids in our public school system is reading or doing math at grade level. And when you think about the amount of money this city has, the amount of resources this city has, it is completely, completely indefensible. And we need to elect leadership to an office like Comptroller that is going to make sure that the city starts solving problems, that the city gets into the business of solving problems for everyday New Yorkers. And that's why I'm running for Comptroller. And that's what I intend to do as your next Comptroller. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. So David, closing statements. Yeah, thank you, Tanya. Uh, Zach referred to the New York Post. Um, they actually said some very nice things about me as well and, and picking me as their second choice. But I was happy to get the endorsement last weekend of the New York Daily News and also went into a great detail um, on uh, some of the things that I've been saying and, uh, and, and shows me uh, as uh, their only choice. Uh, I'm also very proud that I have over 30 elected officials uh, supporting me uh, and we're adding uh, Congresswoman Grace Meng uh, to that list uh, this week. So, uh, you know, I, it, it, from all five boroughs, uh, I have support and, uh, you know, I think that's, uh, that's important. The, uh, coalition we're building. But uh, most and foremost, uh, first and foremost, uh, I think my finance background is directly related uh, to helping uh, bringing the city back and really performing the duties uh, specifically uh, of the city controller in, in their various divisions. The debt issuance function, as I mentioned, I had a 25-year uh, municipal finance Wall Street career. 
uh, with major firms on Wall Street directly related to uh, floating bond issues and uh, refunding existing bond issues and saving money uh, in those uh, refundings. Uh, my background is a deputy superintendent of banking, uh, regulating a, a 500 person banking department uh, is, is directly uh, relevant and uh, serving, most importantly, serving as chair of the finance committee of the city council for eight consecutive years, balancing eight consecutive budgets during the toughest times in our city's history, right after 9-11 uh, and during the 2008-2009 during the recession. Uh, and uh, we basically got through those crises with uh, turning the deficits into surpluses uh, without uh, raising taxes and with that significant taxes and without uh, major budget cuts. So I'm proud of that record. Uh, and I'd like to play a role in bringing back New York City, the city that I've lived in my entire life and that I love. Well, we wanna thank you uh, for joining us today. As we said, it's, it's, it's here where decisions are made in terms of for voters, the people who show up, the people they can hear from. And so we really appreciate you making the time and for the voters, I hope that this was helpful to helping you understand more about this role of the comptroller and how they can they can help to uh, uh, positively impact our community. And so we wanna thank you both, Zach and David for joining us and uh, please stay in touch with us and our community um, as we continue um, our advocacy on these issues. And we hope to continue to hear from you soon. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for thank inviting you us. so much, thank you. And this will be recorded, so I'll send you the link, okay? That's this great. Being recorded. I'll send you the link. And my website is davidfornyc.com. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And for everybody who's attending today, thank you so much for, for joining us again for this part two. Um, we are so grateful to you and the community for you know, staying strong and persistent and, and making sure that we are heard on these issues. Uh, we wanted to make sure that you you hear from the candidates so we can start making smart choices uh, in terms of people who are gonna represent us because we really feel as a task force that the people that we have representing us in political office, they have a, a huge impact on the quality of our, uh, of our life here in our community. And so it's extremely important that we know who's running, that we know uh, that we make the, the best choices, the most appropriate best choices for our community. And so I want to thank you for that. I uh, want to acknowledge those who didn't join us tonight. Uh, <laughs> so other comptroller candidates uh, who didn't join us tonight, Corey Johnson, Kevin Parker, uh, Brian Benjamin. Um, and so we want to, uh, you know, ask you to, to keep up with us in terms of our task force. As we said, we are uh, community led. I am also uh, the second vice chair of Community Board 12 Manhattan, but I do this outside of that role. Um, but I would like you to keep up with us. We are on Facebook. Uh, feel free to join us. We are continuing our advocacy. We put out, as some of you, many of you know, a list of recommendations that have been cited by a number of elected officials already. Some have already taken on some of our recommendations uh, to help address these issues. And so we hope that you continue to follow us and help us advocate uh, for these recommendations to be enacted. So thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. I want to thank my crew here, David, L'Oreal, Cheryl, Liz, uh, for helping, helping out tonight. We can't make this happen without you. Um, thank you, everybody. We appreciate you. And I ask my crew to stay on for a little bit while the rest of us say goodnight. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, Washington Heights Inwood. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. <laughs> so crew we're going to stay on you all can turn your cameras on if you want now liz david well i know cheryl's on the phone